it's um It's um It's um Okay, brothers, if you can get started now, let me get the program up. Good, yes. Jumbo, brothers and sisters, uh, the First Community Interfaith Institute Incorporated welcomes you to our 51st annual Malcolm X program. Today, celebrate uh, the life and contributions of Richard, Richard, serve again. Richard, serve again. Serve again. Oh. Okay, thank you. Jumbo, brothers and sisters, the First Community Interfaith Institute Incorporated welcomes you to our 51st annual Malcolm X program. Today, we celebrate the life and contributions of Minister Malcolm X, also known as El Haj Malik Shabazz. My name is Brother Deb Coleman. I am a student of the sophomore ministry school of duology. I am a distributor of the duology press release. Uh, this is the official newsletter uh, for the first community Interfaith Institute Incorporated that you see here. Um, I serve also as a student duology hour uh, MC on Sundays here at four o'clock at the First Community Interfaith Institute Incorporated. I give honor to God. I give honor to our ancestors. I give honor to our late national minister, uh, Minister Lorenzi Evans Senior. I thank God for uh, waking us up this morning, Lord, and starting us on our way to even be able to celebrate Malcolm X's life today at the First Community Interfaith Institute Incorporated. Thank you all for joining us at the Zoom meeting today and joining us via social media. So brothers and sisters, uh, without further ado, uh, we'll go into our program and we'll observe the Black National Anthem. Yeah. 
Thank you everyone uh, for uh, your observation of the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Uh, the children were wonderful. Let's give them another hand. That was outstanding. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, at this time I want to introduce uh, another student of the Ministry School of, of Duality. Yeah, I sort of did it within the... Uh, and I, 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 yes, yes. Um, yes, I want to just introduce another student of the Ministry School of Duology, uh, Brother Brian Griffin. The student in the Junior Ministry School of Duology as taught by our national leader, uh, Minister Lawrence Evans Sr. He also serves as uh, coordinator of services and programs here at the First Community and Faith Institute Incorporated. And He's going to give us the uh, FCII uh, policy statement. So, without further ado, Brother Brian. Jumbo, everyone. Jumbo. Policy statement of First Community Interfaith Institute reads First Community Interfaith Institute Incorporated is a spiritual and cultural organization plus a teaching church that promotes the development of Afro-American African people. We are not a social agency, nor do we serve as a welfare agency. Our purpose is not to quote unquote, save anyone, but to enhance our people's liberation and self-determination. We reject the idea that the word quote unquote, community leader can be used by those who do not follow. We support our leaders by our actions and attendance at events and programs. We refuse to give anyone a religion or an ideology. Our goal is to help develop a duology for African and Afro-American people. Religious ideological bigotry is not accepted. If there, excuse me, if there was, is one religion, it is truth. If there's a right ideology, it is duology. We have programs and services available for the welfare of our people. We usually respond to the demands of our members and supporters, our constituency, and only our constituency has the right to make their demands on us. And that is a policy statement of First Community Interfaith Institute Incorporated. Amen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Brother Brian, for the uh, policy statement. It always gives uh, everyone a, a, an idea of what the Institute is about in general. Uh, right mm -hmm. now, I want to introduce uh, Sister Uimana Oni. She is a student of the Senior Ministry School of Duology, and she's going to um, give us the bottle song. We have a bottle campaign at First Community Interfaith Institute Incorporated to help out with the educational programs here. 
Uh, so without further ado, Sister Uimana Ono. Amen. John Ray Moore. John One minute. Just to go here. Okay. Um, but remind one that um, we are live streaming on YouTube. So you can always watch this video again at your leisure. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Excuse me. Bible deep Bible summary for the two weeks ending March 15th. Cash equivalent, 1,160 bottles, $58. As the box obtained, the road ran to the women yesterday. 1,442 bottles. So over the two weeks, 2,602 bottles. Amen. Over the month of May, 2,602 bottles. Grand total for the year to date, 20,031 bottles. So we did pretty well Amen. this particular time. Arrange click bottles. Brother Brian, yours truly. Pick up balls, Brother Brian. Organize balls, Brother Brian, yours truly. To ball store, Brother Brian. Gave balls on the middle of the lease. This is Gene Harris, 795. Yours truly, 626. Committee, Dr. Jim Bowers, Sister Kim Haygood, Sister Cynthia Johnson, Sister Jackie Hopkins, 328. Sister Shani, 215. Brother Zeb, 193. Sister Mia Gay, 143. Brother Saul Jane, 111. Brother Brian, 103. Sister Quita, 50. Brother Sharon Bates, 38. Thank you, Boston Cans. Please keep those coming. They help keep the lights on, pretty much at this point. <laughs> General, thank you. You're very welcome, sister. Yes, sir. Thank you very, very much for the bottle summary. And once again, um, keep those bottles and cans coming, brothers and sisters, because they go a long way in our uh, uh, supporting our educational programs here at the First Community Interfaith Institute Incorporated. While it's only the middle of uh, May, and the year to date total is 20,031 cans and bottles. That's outstanding, as the sister said, uh, given these particular times that we find ourselves in. So let's give the sister another hand, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, as I said, this is the Malcolm X uh, program. This is the 51st annual uh, Malcolm X program here at the uh, First Community of Faith Institute Incorporated. And the theme is Malcolm X and the Harlem Connection. Uh, so at this time, we're going to have students from the Ministry School of Duology uh, go over the biography of Brother Malcolm X. Uh, the first student to uh, read some biographical material for us will be Brother Brian Griffin. So, dear brother, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, sir. During his lifetime... Malcolm X had been referred to by different names at different points in his life. He was born Malcolm Little on May 19, 1925 in Omaha, Nebraska. His father was a Baptist preacher as well as the organizer for the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which was founded by Marcus Garvey in 1911. Yes. Malcolm Little had, very, had a very troubled Excuse me. Childhood. His father was killed for trying to organize blacks in Michigan, and his mother became mentally ill due to the strain of raising a family during the Great Depression. In the autobiography of Malcolm X, Malcolm recalls a conversation that he had with his eighth grade English teacher. The teacher asked yes, if he had been thinking about a career. Malcolm replied, Well, yes, sir, I've been thinking I'd like to be a lawyer. His teacher responded, saying, but you've got to be realistic about this, about being a nigger. A lawyer that's not realistic, excuse me, a lawyer that's not realistic goal for a nigger. He then encouraged Malcolm to plan on being a carpenter because he was good with his hands. Malcolm recalled that the more he thought about it, the more uneasy it made him 
and it was then that he began to change inside. After his mother was institutionalized, his family was split, split up among relatives and foster homes. At age 16, Malcolm moved to New York City where he became known as Detroit Red. He found work shining shoes working as a commuter train, working on a commuter train and as a waiter. Red eventually became a full-time hustler after being fired by a restaurant for finding a prostitute for a customer. During this time in his life, many of today's African-American youth, excuse me, during this time in his life, he lived like many of today's African-American youth. He was unskilled and a school dropout. He tried a few legal employment opportunities, but later found out it's easier to take advantage of the many illegal opportunities. These same illegal opportunities continue to lure tens of thousands of our youth into a cycle of criminal activity. Red sold drugs, pimped, and became a dope addict. He committed armed robbery and burglary to support his drug habit. Thank you. You're welcome, dear brother. Man. Thank you very much, brother Brian. Uh, for the biography of Malcolm X. Uh, once again, my name is Brother Zeb Coleman. I'm a student of the sophomore ministry school of duology and I'll read an, an excerpt uh, on the biography of the life of Malcolm X. In 1946, Malcolm was convicted of burglary and sentenced to a 10 year prison term. By this time, Malcolm was a hard, bitter man. The other inmates considered him so mean that they nicknamed him Satan, quote unquote. This was probably the lowest point in his life. However, it was within those prison walls that he began to rebuild his life. The Malcolm that entered Charlestown State Prison in 1946 would not be the same Malcolm to leave prison six years later. While in prison, he was introduced to the Islamic teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm was attracted to Elijah's teaching that the white man was the devil, quote unquote. He felt that this explained why he had such a hard, painful life. This belief lifted his self-blame and low self-esteem and left the blame with the white devil, quote unquote. In Malcolm's mind, his life of trouble began to make sense. This devil, quote unquote, became the reason his father was killed, why his mother was ill, why he was uneducated, why crime was the most obvious option for him and why he was now in prison. He then pledged to Allah that he would, quote, tell the black man the true teachings of Islam and the white man the truth about his crimes, unquote. Malcolm began to improve his vocabulary by memorizing the words in a dictionary. He also took correspondence courses in English and Latin. Most importantly, he would regularly correspond with his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He had become so strong in his faith that he led prison study groups on Islam. In 1952, Malcolm was paroled and lived with his brother Wilfred. During this time, he worked for a furniture company, an automobile manufacturer, and continued to study Islam in Detroit Temple Number no. 1, where he received his ex, quote, unquote. In 1953, Malcolm was appointed assistant minister of temple number one and later as Elijah Muhammad's prime minister throughout the United States. Malcolm went on to organize Nation of Islam in OI mosque in Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Atlanta, and Los Angeles. Thank you. Um, 
the readings from this book, Kiddos in Ms. Evans Library, African American Holidays, Historical Research, and Resource Guide to Culture Celebrations. And Ms. Anike was at a festival many, many years ago. I'll okay, take this story on home. 1958, Malcolm married Sister Betty X, and together they had six daughters. As a husband, he was devoted, loving, and affectionate to his wife. Despite his tarnished past, Malcolm X became, quote, Prince of the Black Revolution, quote. His love of African people and the strength that he showed was inspiration for two thousands of people. In 1964, after he left Nation of Islam, there are many more threats on his life. In response to reporters' question regarding him being concerned about these threats, Malcolm said, quote, I don't worry. I believe that I'm a man that died 20 years ago, referring to his past addiction and crimes. I live like a man who is dead already. I have no fear already, I'm sorry, whatsoever, of anybody or anything, quote, end quote. It was this curse that inspired Black Militancy Group, I'm sorry, Black, Black Militancy among youth of the 60s. His undying measures of rights by the battle of the bullet and freedom by any means necessary still inspired a new generation of youth. Malcolm's message instilled boldness with violent retaliation. It was this boldness that challenged the centuries of fear that African Americans held of white people. Malcolm was assassinated February 21st, 1965, by three black men while addressing an audience at the Audubon Forum in Harlem. He had just begun a new chapter in his life as El Hajj Miguel Shabazz, founder of Muslim Mosque Inc., an organization of African American unity. In his last year, he began to spread the understanding that the oppression of African Americans was human rights issue instead of civil rights. As an issue of human rights, Malcolm tended to appeal to the world court of oppressed blacks. Jumbo. Jumbo. Thank you, sister. Uh, thank you. Uh, brothers and sisters, we want to thank the students of the Ministry School of Theology for the biography of Brother Malcolm X. Thank you, Brother Brian. Uh, I did not to thank myself, but myself. And, and thank you, Sister Manoli. Just to give the students a hand. It's very beautiful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, brothers and sisters, um, as you know, this Malcolm X uh, celebration this year uh, is uh, the theme is Malcolm X, Malcolm X and the Harlem Connection. And although we celebrated today, today was the 16th of May, his actual birthday is May 19th, uh, 1925. We're just having it today because it's a Sunday. But uh, there's probably going to be things going on throughout the uh, community, throughout the nation, in the world. But this is actually a national celebration and actually a worldwide celebration because uh, uh, Malcolm X definitely influenced uh, things here domestically and, and all over the globe. Uh, yes, sir. So uh, at this time, we have a presentation based on that theme. Uh, the presentation is called Malcolm X and the Harlem Connection uh, by our uh, sister, Rui Manoni. She is a student in the Senior Ministry School of Duology. Without further ado, Sister Rimana. Jumbo. Jumbo. Malcolm X and Harlem Connection. Okay, why well, I'm calling Harlem Connection because Malcolm X spent his adult life in Harlem, working in Harlem. I'm not talking about when he was very young and doing the um the hustling thing. I'm talking about when he was out the um jail and became part of the nation and whatnot till he passed. So that's the part the story we're gonna focus on as far as Home connection, Jumbo. Jumbo. Where is Harlem? Harlem is a neighborhood of Manhattan, New York City. It was a predominantly Black Latino community in World War I to the 2000s, when gentrification 
became an issue. And on your left-hand side, you'll see the, the map of the rough um, boundaries of Harlem. Mm -hmm. In the 1920s, Chelsea West Harlem was associated with the Harlem Renaissance. Our now point of artistic work, we discussed Harlem's many times at least in the past. Donald Marcus Garvey, Father Vine, organized in Harlem as well. Harlem as a backdrop. Harlem was both a stage and a player during the turbulent period of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. If you like Queen Mother Moore, Ramon Clean Powell Jr., Malcolm X, and many others, who articulate the sentiments of this message from street corners and pulpits throughout the community. Malcolm X arrived in Harlem as Chief Minister of the Nation of Islam, Muslim 7954. It was appointed by Amal Elijah Muhammad. It was a Muslim Muslim that he met, Love his life, Sister Betty. Mm -hmm. So the Muslim said that few minutes of Louis Farrakhan was approached of Malcolm, first saw Malcolm speak. And the Bible called Malcolm. Ms. Muhammad's teachings read to interact American black people. Some obviously has to grow very big. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm sorry, it's typo. Excuse me. <laughs> and nowhere in America was such a single temple potential available as New York City's five bureaus. Yes, sir. Oh, that's nice. Ooh. Let me get up in a second. One second, everyone. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Muslim 7, also known as Muhammad's Temple of Islam 7, was located on 102 West 116th Street. Okay, and this is um, what is um, currently on your left, the, the photo there. On February 21st, 1965, I researched Brother Malcolm. Moss was firebombed and destroyed. In 1976, Imam W.D. Muhammad to see his father as he did NOI after his father passed. He renamed him number seven, Masjid Malcolm Shabazz. And that's the building seated with the green dome. The Masjid Ma Malcolm Shabazz is not filled with NOI. It's about one of the organization, runs a school, and the outdoor Malcolm Shabazz Hall and Market hosts interfaith events. You know, I passed this, I must have passed the building a million times. I didn't know what it was back in the day. Wow. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is a picture of the African National Memorial Bookstore. It was around for 40 something years. I was no longer in assistance. This is where Malcolm spoke a lot of times. This, this was like his little hangout where he studied, and got books, and whatnot. On by Louis Michel, brother of Oscar, the first major black filmmaker, the African National Memorial Bookstore carried all black oriented literature. It was a place where Malcolm studied black history. Louis Michel was invited to Malcolm, and the front of the bookstore was a rallying point of political speakers. And Mrs. Lewis passed away in 1976. And um, the bookstore pretty much died with him. On April 26, 1957, a large crowd from the nation gathered around the 20th precinct during the riot of one of the members, Brother Hinton, was denied medical attention from police altercation, where Brother Hinton was severely beaten. Malcolm de-escalated the situation single-handedly. Eventually, Emma was transported to brother to Harlem Hospital, and nation followers walked down Lenox Avenue, roughly 10 blocks, 
followed by other community leaders. This incident increased both nation and brother Malcolm. Test Muslim 7 increased substantially. And as a footnote, um, which I, I was not aware of, so I did the research. The brother Hinton eventually got a $70,000 seven from the city of New York. Thanks part of brother Malcolm. And that was a big thing at the time, $70,000. Today, it would be a lot more money. Okay, but it was the 50s, so keep that in mind. Okay, came on to the um, Holland Hospital. Kids know is that I didn't really know about. And I see two Holland Hospital employees, predominantly Black and Puerto Rican, went on strike for better wages and benefits. Malcolm Courtney, the coach of activists and politicians, and supported workers. The strike was successful, and the union, Local of 99, went on to organize many New York City's hospitals. Holland Hospital is located at 506 Lenox Avenue. Also, it's Malcolm X Boulevard, New West 135th Street. In 1964, after Malcolm's departure from Nation Islam, he converted Orthodox Islam, changing his name to El Hajj Miguel Shabazz. Her return to the Mecca, Saudi Arabia, he found a sunni, a sunny mosque on West 113th Street, Sydney Avenue called Muslim Mosque Incorporated. The mosque started with a core of about 50 dedicated activists. Unfortunately, the mosque disbanded after Brother Malcolm's assassination. On February 21st, 1965, gunfire rang out at the meeting of the OAAU, knowledge is arm of Malcolm's organization. Post Nation of Islam at Audubon Ballroom, which is located, which is located at Broadway West 165th Street. Hajj Miguel Shabazz was shot in front of his family while speaking to the crowd. They made a transition at a nearby Clinton Presbyterian Hospital. In mid 2005, from Audubon Ballroom transformed into the Malcolm X Dr. Ray Shabazz Memorial Educational Center and his website is shabazzcenter.org. And the center houses the most extensive collection of Malcolm Dr. Bass, Dr. Shabazz, excuse me, as well as hosting educational programs. The Ilya Shabazz has written quite a few books on her father over the years. She's on board trustees. And I'm pretty sure that um, if you go on their website, social media, they'll be having something this Wednesday to honor the 96th birthday of Ashmika Shabazz. Amen. And um, listen to Malcolm X's own words. From 1963. It's time for you and me to unite, to get together and get this big white feet off our back. You got a bad habit. You're hooked and don't know it. You got what's known as white disease. You think you can't get along without the white man. You think you can't get some clothes without the white man. You think you can't get a house without the white man. You think you can't even get a job without the white man. You're worse than a man who thinks he can't get along without Huron. You're worse than the man who thinks he can't get along without morphine. You're worse than the junkie. You're in worse shape than the junkie because the junkie only has a little monkey on his back and you're running around with a big white ape named Uncle Sam on your back. <laughs> America is faced with her worst domestic crisis since the Civil War or since the Revolutionary War. For America now faces a race war. A race war is worse than a Revolutionary War. A race war is worse than a civil war. A race war is a war in which no holes are barred. A race war is a war in which children are destroyed, in which children are mutilated, 
in which children face the same destructive wrath that grown-ups face. The race, a race war is the worst war that you can conceive. And this war, race war, that is coming upon the head of the white man is something that he is bringing down upon himself. The entire country is on the verge of erupting into racial violence and bloodshed. Simply because 20 million ex-slaves are demanding freedom, justice, and equality here in America from their former slave master. 20 million so-called Negroes, second-class citizens, seeking human dignity, seeking human rights, seeking the right to live in dignity as a human being. And rather than give genuine respect and recognition to your cry for human rights, the American white man answers your nonviolence with violence. He answers your prayers and your freedom songs with false promises, deceitful maneuvers, and outright bloodshed. According to what we are taught from the white man's textbooks and his school, the Revolutionary War and the Civil War were two wars fought on American soil supposedly for freedom and democracy. But that these two wars were really for the freedom and human dignity of all men, why are 20 million of our people still confined here in America and enslaved by second-class citizenship? Something is wrong. The truth is that the Revolutionary War was fought on American soil to free the American white man from the English white man. The Revolutionary War was never fought to provide freedom and democracy in this white country for the black man. Our people remain slaves here in America even after the Declaration of Independence was signed. In fact, most of the white founding fathers who signed the Declaration of Independence were nothing but slave owners themselves. It is sheer hypocrisy, sheer ignorance, sheer insanity for our people here in America to celebrate the 4th of July as Independence Day, while white America still denies us first-class citizenship that goes with an independent people. And it is nothing but hypocrisy for the American white man to pretend that the Revolutionary War was truly a war of independence as long as 20 million black people here in America are denied the privileges of an independent people. Don't let the white man fool you. Don't let the white man smile at you and lull you to sleep. Behind that smile is a vicious heart. Behind those teeth is an animal like beast who doesn't have it within him to want for you what he wants for himself and his own kind. Don't let that man fool you. When you look at that man, you're supposed to see him for exactly what he is. And if you want to know what he is, examine his deeds. Forget his words. He got a whole lot of pretty sounding words. Watch his deeds. His deeds are like the deeds of a snake, the deeds of a serpent, the, needs of, the deeds of a dragon, the deeds of a reptile, the deeds of a beast. Why nothing but a race of beasts would take dogs and stick them on little black babies. Nothing but a race of beasts will set dogs on black children and black women. Nothing but a race of beasts. And it is for these and it is these deeds today that's causing the wrath of God to come down upon the head of the white man. And when you see him as he is and see how much hell he's catching, you're out of his mind to want to be with him. You're out of his mind to want you're out of your mind to want to integrate with him. And you're really out of your mind if you take time to forgive him and ask God to have mercy on him. No, ask God to judge him. Ask God to do unto him as he has done unto you. He has caused your babies to suffer. Ask God to heap suffering upon his babies. He has caused your women to suffer. Ask God to heap suffering on his women. He has caused all of our people to suffer. You can't deny that. You may not like my saying it, but you can't deny it. Why, you got scars and knots on your head from the 
top of your head to the bottom of your feet. And every one of those scars is evidence against the American white man and his hidden inhumanity to man. The Civil War was also fought on this continent, not to free the black slaves, as is commonly taught in the white man's school, but the Civil War was actually fought to preserve the Union, preserve this country, keep it intact for white people. It wasn't fought to set you free. It wasn't fought to give you some kind of emancipation. It wasn't fought to make you a citizen. It wasn't fought to give you civil rights. It wasn't fought because they respected you and loved you as a human being. It was fought out of greed. It was fought out of selfishness. It was fought to keep this country intact for their own white selves. In essence, this only means that the American white man fought the Revolutionary War to get this country for himself. And he then fought the Civil War to keep this country intact for himself. And today, he will now fight a race war to keep from having to share this white country on an equal basis with anyone else but his white self, especially on an equal basis with his 20 million former slaves. So again I ask, where will all of these demonstrations end? And who dares to say that our people are not justified by demonstrating their resentment over the injustice and mistreatment that our people have suffered these 400 years at the hands of this cruel, inhuman American white man. We have nothing to lose but our change. We have nothing to lose but the hell we experience every day living here in these rat-filled slums. You have to excuse me for being blunt speaking. And frank talk, we don't care who likes it or not, as long as we know it's the truth. Much of what I say might sound bitter, but it's the truth. Right. Much, of, much of what I say might sound like it's stirring up trouble, but it's the truth. Right. Much of what I say might sound like it is hate, but it's the truth. And God will God has uh, mentioned in the Bible, it's truth alone today that'll make you free. If you're afraid to tell the truth, why you don't even deserve freedom. Just tell the truth. Okay. Um. Okay. I forgot to, to um. Yes. Maybe some help. I say. That brings us to the conclusion of our presentation, Melville's and Home Connection. Any questions? Okay. I will turn the brothers up. Let me. Um, let me put this up again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our brothers and sisters, uh, let's give uh, Minister Malcolm X, also known as El Haj Malik Shabazz, Another round of applause uh, for a beautiful presentation. This is Minister, this is Malcolm in his own words uh, from Harlem Unity Rally in 1963. Uh, and some of these uh, issues for freedom, justice and equality uh, seem to uh, still resonate to this very day in that we have a lot of work to do to uh, uh, bring this the eventual uh, universal worldwide community where we all can get along in peace, that we have some work to do to bring that into existence. And Malcolm simply felt that uh, uh, for us to receive justice as black people, this would be the first step in ensuring that the whole human family would experience a freedom, justice, and equality 
regardless to their race, religion, creed, or what what have you. Uh, like he said, that may have sound a little harsh uh, to some people, but uh, we all have our particular methodologies, uh, but the goal is freedom and justice and equality for the entire human family. So thank you very much, Sister Wimana, for that presentation, uh, Malcolm X and the Harlem Connection. Uh, brothers and sisters, as we kind of wind down our program, I'd like to share with us uh, the 23rd Psalm from the Holy Bible. It's the 23rd Psalm, this is the King James Version, and it reads, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, we're going to acknowledge someone very special today. Uh, his birthday was yesterday, the 15th of May. I'm speaking of none other than Brother Kai. So at this time, we're going to have a birthday uh, acknowledgement for Brother Kai. Sister Iman, you have some words? Come on. Yes. So, um, happy birthday, Kai Kai. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Kai Kai is actually sleeping. That's all right. That's all right. Wake up, boy. <laughs> oh. I can go show you to him so you can sing happy birthday. Maybe he'll wake up, but he's sleeping. Oh, there he is. Hi, Kai. Happy birthday. We can't hear that birthday song. <laughs> Children, yes, the and for remembrance. Happy birthday to you. 
birthday to me. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Imano, for playing for playing the Happy Birthday song by Stevie Wonder. Happy birthday to Kai. How's he doing, Shari? Is she there? He's going okay. Uh, Praise it. Yeah, a nice party I saw. Yeah, he did have a nice birthday party. Hallelujah. Last Bless so another year. <laughs> he <done> ran his <laughs> Yeah. He's a strong little boy. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Uh, happy birthday to you, Kai. Many, many more to you. Um, and uh, how old is Kai now? Kai is six. He's the grand, that is the grandson of our late national minister, Lorenzo Evans Sr. Um, and he's here. Uh, we stand on your grandfather's shoulders. We stand on Minister Malcolm X's shoulders and happy birthday to him too. Uh, his birthday is on the 19th. So happy birthday, Kai. Happy birthday, Minister Malcolm X, AKA El Haj Shabazz, uh, El Haj Malik Shabazz, excuse me. So thank you and many, many more to you. And somebody said, wake up boy. Now you didn't see me say that because I wasn't authorized to say nothing like that. <laughs> that had to be a close relative with somebody close to him that can say, get up boy like that. <laughs> so God is good and he's good all the time. So brothers and sisters, uh, thank you once again for attending our 51st annual Malcolm X program in honor of Malcolm X. Uh, thank you very much. We're gonna close our program uh, with closing prayer. Then I have some a uh, few quick announcements and then we all can disperse and uh, go home to our humble abodes and continue to enjoy our day and continue to really enjoy this beautiful weather that's been coming up lately. So the closing prayers are as such, brothers and sisters, prayers. Dear God, we thank you for waking us up this morning and setting us on our way, clothed in our right minds and peace of mind for our health and strength. Thank you, Father God, for our late national minister, our ancestors, and our national minister, Gerald Evans. Thank you for Minister Malcolm X and the legacy that he left. Thank you, Lord, for time, people, and money to help us to be successful. Dear Heavenly Father, put a hedge of protection around us from all hurt, from all harm and danger in this time of pandemic, in this time of social unrest. Dear God, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. We ask these things in the light and the way. Amen. Amen. We praise the Lord. Um, just some quick announcements, closing announcements some uh, pretty good things going on here at the First Community Interfaith Institute. Uh, first of all, we have our students duology hour every Sunday at 4 p.m. here at 219 Hamilton Street. This is a 10 seat maximum uh, socially distanced uh, uh, student duology hour. Masks are required. Uh, we do have some hand sanitizer here also. Uh, don't forget to view our student duology hour that's on Sunday at 4 p.m. at the YouTube uh, website. Uh, this presentation is done by our, our student national treasurer, uh, Sister Wimana Oni. Uh, the press release is available. Uh, the press release, like I said, the duology press release is the official newsletter for the first community interfaith institute corporate. You can get these here at the Institute, or if you see the various students in the community, you can, uh, you can, get one as well. Um, also just remember, uh, brothers and sisters, 
that the 42nd annual Minister Akilah Ife Evans Festival in Elyria, Ohio will be July 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, uh, 2021. For more details, please uh, come to the First Community Interfaith Institute Incorporated. Um, our next major event will be Legacy Day. That's in honor of Martha McMillan Jordan. Uh, she taught our national minister, Lorenz Lee Evans Sr., a vast amount of esoteric knowledge. This allowed him to form the first community interfaith institute incorporated uh, November 2nd, 1970. So come on out. Uh, more, more details will be forthcoming uh, con con concerning that. Uh, let me see. Yes, sister. Praise the Lord. Yes, also the sister informed me that for our student duology hour uh, services every Sunday at 4 p.m. at 219 Hamilton Street, we'll be outside in the yard. Uh, when the pandemic first hit, we, we, start, we moved our activities outside uh, in August. So the, the weather is starting to uh, improve again and we'll move that outside again. It's very nice, very beautiful yard we have here. So come, come uh, join us for that. And, and thank you, sister. Oh yes, also brothers and sisters, please uh, remember to register to vote. Um, the, uh, and, and when you register, please go out and vote on primary day. This is June 22nd, 2021. The polls here locally will be open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. So just don't forget to vote because one of those things that uh, Malcolm conveyed to us is that um, one of the ways we could see some degree of freedom, justice, equality is through politics, through the electoral process. Although he thought of more things that we needed to do as far as uh, business ownership and independent things. He did see some benefit in, in the voting and uh, political process. So please go out and, and vote June 22nd. And if you haven't done so, please register to vote. Uh, yes, you just wanna keep every, anyone who has lost anyone uh, to the pandemic, uh, to social unrest, or for any reason whatsoever, we wanna keep you in our prayers uh, and thank you. Uh, those are the announcements for this week. Uh, once again, thank you all for coming out. Once again, my name is Brother Zeb Coleman. I've been your MC. Thank you for being patient with me and allowing me to MC. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.